So reflecting on the way it is, this uh, ability the human individual has to notice and pay attention where the knowing, the observing, the and no longer from personal preferences or judgments, according to one, what one likes or dislikes, approves of or disapproves of, but from the Buddha Dhamma position, where from the knowing all conditions are impermanent, and being the knower of Dhamma rather than the person knowing all about Buddhism. And so in recognizing, ask yourself the question like the, the Sakya Ditti, the personality, and the pure subjectivity of this moment. Like on the, the way it is, is that each one of us is experiencing consciousness through the form, the body. So consciousness within the containment, boundaries, limitations of the human form, male or female, whatever karma it has, the way, you know, the, the vipaka kama, the, the karma of being this body. With this karma, the conditions that form this personality, the emotional habits and so forth. But we're not we're not looking at the, these in terms of the, the conditions, the the personal aspects, and taking an interest in in the, in them on trying to figure out why I get angry, why I feel insecure, and that. But to uh, be the observer of this, the observer of of uh, emotion, of thought memory of the body itself. So this is like Buddha Dhamma Sangha, the pure conscious knowing of the way it is. And so reflecting in this way breaks down all the assumptions, the prejudices, the opinions that that one inevitably has as a person. The personality, you know, I have certain views, opinion, habits, cultural attitudes, that are different from what you might have. And so, in the, on the personal level, there's, there's, you know, in, in the Sangha, you can see, on, the, the conflicts usually arise around personal attitude, personality. What I think and, and what you think. But, ref but resting in the pure subjectivity of consciousness is mindfulness, isn't it? This is what Satisapachanya allows us to be the pure subject rather than this personality. Now my personality is uh, conditioned out of ignorance and desire, so it, it's never content. My personality on a personal level, I don't, it, it, I don't experience contentment as a person. As a person, then the then this personality is always, I can always think of improving, of something better, of, you know, wanting something I don't have yet, or being discontented because uh, the way it is isn't what I want. So, so on a personal level, there's this feeling of discontentment, uh, Complaining mind, uh, fear, jealousy, 
anxiety, worry. And this is created through uh, this ignorance of Icha and not being aware, then I, it's so easy to just get caught into the mood, into the conditioning, the, the conditions of my personality, my fears and desires and so forth. But when I really pay attention, mindful, then I'm aware of this personality as an object. Sakya Ditti is a condition that arises and ceases. So it's learning to discern the difference between pure subjectivity and Sakya Ditti. So when you when you try to think of the uh, on the personal level on the thinking level of anatta, the no self concept. You know, my my thinking mind tends to I've got to kind of destroy my personality or just dismiss it or whatever it's, it's like you. It's an it takes you to a sense of wanting to annihilate, a kind of nihilism. But the the, the term anatta isn't meant not meant to be a, a kind of doctrine that one grasps, but a suggestion: what is self and what is not self. What can I claim is me and mine, and what can't I claim? What, what is it that I can't claim as being mine? So just asking questions like this, you know, as you're thinking, when I get lost in my thinking and my preferences and my biases, my ideas, my memories, then I you know, I can have very strong views about all kinds of things, and preferences and resentments. I can get righteous, the indignant, and fed up and disgusted. And the world now is in a state, you know, internationally, there's terrible things going on, and they just people butchering each other, blah, uh, bombing each other over. It's just holding to views through this kind of ignorance. Then we torment ourselves and each other. So in, uh, with awareness, then what I would refer to is pure subjectivity, puto, the knowing. So, so this is where recognizing that consciousness, vijnana, is natural state. I don't create out of ignorance. It's not personal. Vijnana consciousness is not personal. It's not my consciousness is, is uh, you know, I created that. It's a uh, male consciousness, it's uh, American consciousness, it's, it's my consciousness. I can say these words, you know, I can say anything, make any sane or insane statement. But in terms of reflection and observing the way it is, consciousness has nothing to do. It's not a, something that I, uh, you know, I'm conscious even, you know, when I'm totally deluded or fully mindful, consciousness is a function. It doesn't, it's not something that I, uh, that is cultural or anything other than it is what it is. It's the ability to know, witness the present. So in this position of a separate form, seemingly separate form, this body, awakened to the way it is. And so the Buddha's teaching is, is, is a skillful means 
of exploring, investigating, and experiencing the present that is not going to reinforce per personality or ignorance if you use it properly. Now I create my personality into conscious moment. So this moment is conscious, you know, this like this. And I, when I'm reflecting like this, I hear the sound of silence, the background, sitting, breathing. There's mindfulness, some, uh, there's uh, intuition. Now, if I don't bother with that, with that kind of reflecting, then I tend to operate from opinions and views, how I feel about uh, maybe uh, something I'm carrying from yesterday, some, some resentment or some uh, axe to grind or... So then I, you know, I start thinking and judging and remembering and getting lost in these memories, these feelings, emotions that arise. And so the subject, I'm giving this, this subjectivity to this mental object, this personality. I bind myself, I manacle myself, fetter myself to these, this sense of myself as a person. I'm right, I think like this, you, should, you shouldn't be like you are, we've got to do something and on and on like that, get into, you know, uh, taking sides, resenting the, the, uh, the threatening forces outside, <coughs> having prejudices and preferences and you can have a war, fight, murder each other over what? Attachment to conditions, to personal views. And the international scene, you know, the, just the, uh, the in, in Israel, Lebanon now, a terrible kind of war taking place because of identities, being Isra Israeli or being uh, Hezbollah or Hamas or <coughs> Muslims and and this is all this is all uh, ignorance this is a result of ignorance of the truth not reflecting on the way it is and grasping these differences and each one feeling they're right you listen to to different uh, leaders of these various groups they're all righteous absolutely right and the other's wrong. So I mean, it's, this is, and, and you can't say, you can't, who, who can you say is the absolute right when all these quarreling factions are coming out of ignorance, grasping of views, identities, that conflict, inevitably conflict. Carrying resentment, isn't it? Just, just, you did this to me so many years ago, <laughs> remembering all the terrible things the other, other person did, and then you just, it makes you angry, enraged, gives you that sense of wanting to get even, take root. Take revenge, kill uh, kill off the offending party, and uh, and then it goes on. This is karma, isn't it? Karma activity, murdering, resenting, acting on anger, greed, delusion, and ignorance. Then, of course, the world is like this. 
Well, how can you ever, how could it be otherwise? So then in uh, meditation, you're awakening to this internal complex. It starts from within the individual. So you, you can't really blame, say, it's uh, their fault or, you see, it's the result of ignorance of Dhamma, or the way, it, the, tr the way it is. Now it's interesting to see uh, Judaism and Islam and Christianity, they all come from the same source. You know, they supposedly all believe in the same God, and, and yet each one thinks God is supporting their side. Now this is uh, conceptual proliferation, isn't it? It's, it's not reflecting on the way it is. It's grasping ideas, ignorant ideas. So then that grasping leads to becoming and, and becoming leads to, you know, continuing, the, you know, acting or doing something uh, and creating more karma, more ignorance follows. So this is the samsara. It's just a, this vortex, whirling vortex of conditions that we we get stuck into it, lost in it. So then, the meditation pavana is awakening, so that we can still have these feelings of revenge and resentment, anger, discontentment whatever, you know, however mild or extreme our emotions might be, but there's an awareness of them. We're seeing them as objects that arise and cease, because that's what they are. They're sankharas. So this awareness since we don't create it, it's not a condition that's created out of ignorance. It's not personal. Mindfulness, you can look at the personal as an object. You can observe the Sakya Ditti with mindfulness. You can't observe Sakya Ditti with Sakya Ditti. You just make judgments about yourself. The Sakya Ditti, you know, I'm trying to analyze myself, uh, you know, my value, my good qualities, bad qualities, and my self-image and all this kind of stuff that people talk about endlessly today is uh, judging myself on a personal level is like Sakya Ditti, using Sakya Ditti and, and then evaluating. I'm like this, I'm like, I should be more like that, I shouldn't be like, I want to get rid of these bad thoughts I'd like to become something else. I don't want to, I don't like the way I am. And it's, I'm this way because of my mother and my father. <laughs> on and on like that. It's, you're caught in the same uh, sensoric cyclone of self. So then <coughs> awakening Mindfulness is awakened attention to the way it is. So it's recognizing this, and knowing this, this is a natural state. Awakenness is not something I personally can claim as, as a quality that, that I have as a person. So that's, therefore, when I've got an idea of what, how, you know, I should be mindful and try to become mindful, I'm operating from Sakya Ditti, from holding a view about myself and what I should be. I'm somebody, I'm not mindful enough and I've got to practice in order to become more mindful. Now, this is, uh, this is Sakya Ditti operating. And so the direct observing of this Sakya Ditti, I am, I'm not mindful enough, I should be more mindful. This is, I can listen, I can observe myself thinking this. 
This is within the awareness of this feeling or this thought or this view. Being the knower of this assumption that I am somebody who's not mindful enough. This is, I create this, this, this is thinking. I am a person, etc. That is a sequence of words that reinforce the sense of uh, sakyaditi. So we create ourselves, our personalities, through thinking, through grasping memories, through ignorance, grasping, and then the result is discontentment, dissatisfaction, And I- even as you get older, you can still get enraged about things that were done to you when you know when you were fifty years ago. That's an interesting thing. I, but when I became a monk, yeah, you know, I could sitting in the forest monastery in Thailand, and there's nothing much to do in the afternoon. So you start re- thinking back. You know, Twenty years ago, this happened to me, it wasn't fair. I was treated badly and nobody apologized. And that shouldn't have happened, I can wind myself up. I noticed I was sitting there in this kuti in Wadwapo and getting myself really angry, enraged. And I could really wind myself up with remembering what happened twenty years before. You know, I'm I'm creating this. I'm making myself angry to the point where I even want to go and murder somebody (laughs) (laughs) over just just kind of winding myself up, remembering this and dwelling on it and then fulminating, kind of simmering and boiling and uh, uh, get myself into a right state of righteous indignation. And yet it has nothing to do with the moment, you know. There's nothing there. Twenty years is a long time. It's all gone. Nothing, you know. What, where did it go? And yet, sitting in a Thai forest monastery, getting myself totally wound up and indignant over something that didn't even happen there. Nothing to do with the place or the situation I was in. Well, just by exploring that, I began to see how, you know, how you can, you know, w- one generation passes resentment down to another. Like you're supposed to never forget the Holocaust. You know, don't ever, ever forget that. So that, you know, you try to keep people remembering even something that, di- that, that didn't happen to you, but happened to your parents or your grandparents. What the English did in Ireland in 200 years ago, and on and on like this, we can, uh, you know, we can really get very indignant and angry over these kind of memories or perceptions. So that's the way the mind is, you know, if you if you're heedless and you don't awaken, then, then you create the endless conflicts in, in your life. It's just the way it is. If you're because on the condition level, it isn't going to be fair and right and perfect. Sometimes it is. Some, sometimes things go very well. and One feels, uh, you know, personally quite satisfied or uncomplaining when, when life presents itself in, in a way that isn't too disruptive and offensive to me. But I could still, I realize, I could sit here and wind myself up about what happened 50 years ago. (laughs) But I know better. (laughs) Seeing through that. Observing how attachment to memory of the past, this is the result. And so this way we, 
begin to investigate, you know, the conditioned realm, attachment and the conditioning. And that's where, you know, the bhavana is really observing this, what attachment is, what non-attachment, the discerning, be knowing the difference. Attachment to conditions is like this. Non-attachment is like this. Now this is something you have to know for yourself. It's budget tongue, way teed up over here. You have to, you know, taste it yourself, know it. You can't, I can't, you know, nobody can explain it beyond this point. So this is what, when I talk about discernment or panya, discerning, it, knowing the difference, discerning that attachment is like this, non-attachment is like, self is like this, no self is like this. So no self, when I experience sound of silence, when I recognize this, It's, it is what it is. I'm not claiming there's some kind of personal problem or personal virtue or anything like that. It is like this. The sense of uh, the memory see. What happened 50 years ago disappeared. But there's a tension, there's intelligence operating, but it's not, it's not coming from memory, attachment to memory, or, or from a sense of personal preference, or my view, my opinion about anything. It's like this. And then I can create myself as a person. I start remembering. I am Ajahn Sumato and on and on like this, I, I can create myself into, uh, you know, a, a Buddhist monk, uh, meditation teacher, I can create myself into all kinds of things by grasping ideas, concepts, memories, believing my emotions are mine, really getting involved in, in indulging in, in my resentments from the past or clinging to ideals of how things should be. I should, I should be compassionate. I should be forgiving. So the, the Sakya Deti is all about I should, I shouldn't, I am this body, I'm, I'm now uh, 72 years old, white male. I am American British now. I am <laughs> I have 40 vasas. This is my 40th vasa. I am <laughs> and I can create myself into into uh, important high ranking Buddhist monk, I can do that just to create thinking and holding on to these views. Or I can take the opposite, or it doesn't matter, titles don't matter, uh, I shouldn't be attached to anything like that. A, a, real, a monk I respect would just be humble, not conceited, contented and easily satisfied. <laughs> That's the ideal, isn't it? The ideal Buddhist monk unburdened with duties, frugal in their ways, and all, and all like that. That's all the great stuff of what should be. And, and then, uh, then the conceit of having, being in a powerful position, being not just an ordinary monk, but special monk, or a Theravadan monk, and on and on like this, I create the self. Now, listening to this, and I'm not trying to 
to condemn or or praise anything, but just recognizing, thinking about myself in these terms is sakya ditti. You know, when I actually believe it, attached to these perceptions. I become this person, and then, uh, then the result is, uh, you know, as a person. Then, then there's, there's always something, you know. People don't respect you properly. Uh, they don't do what you want. You know, I give my life to the sangha, and then people just dis- just dis- disrobe. Don't care. Share my wisdom with you all, and what thanks do I get? I can <laughs> I can really create a scenario of uh, you know the Jewish mother kind of mindset. Or I can just be positive and 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 delight you with jokes and positivity and inspire you, feeling it's my duty uh, to inspire you endlessly. So, the observer of this, though, this is pure subjectivity, then, pure, which, I do, which is non-personal, because it has no sense of me or mine. It's real, it's attentive and intelligent, but it doesn't create a sakyaditi, if you really recognize it. Sakya Ditti doesn't arise in it. Attention, Sati Sampajanya. So from this pure subjectivity you can observe the false subject of the self, me as a person. And, and learning to, you know, exploring this so you really clarify, you know the difference between Sati Sampachanya and Sakya Ditti. Because, uh, you know, before I investigated, I didn't know the difference. You know, it was just the pure subjectivity consciousness itself was so mixed, so... Uh, bound to the conditions of self, I didn't know the difference. There was no discernment. The, my reality was me, this body, I'm this person. My views, my thoughts, my life. This was my reality. This was what I lived with, and this I felt, and I'm, I, I was judgmental, critical of myself, others, and the world around me. So then, and then nobody ever pointed to the pure awareness. So everything in in the culture that I'm from, cultural background, reinforces this delusion. Western civilization reinforces our delusion because it's basically it's del- it's deluded itself. So you know the, the social conditioning, cultural conditioning you know, perpetuates this, this illusion of a separate self. Then the awakened awareness, then the one, uh, as you recognize this, you have to recognize, it's not something you create, so, but, and so it's not something that you can make happen. You have, this is where you need to trust your own ability to observe, listen, pay attention, be the the knower, the puto, the one who knows. And so, in, like in vipassana meditation, this all sankharas are impermanent, all conditions are impermanent, is a suggestion, a way of looking at at Sakya Ditti, at the sense of myself as a person. When I start observing my personality, it's very changeable and very dependent on conditions, praise and blame, success, failure, 
the worldly, eight worldly dhammas, my personality changes accordingly. I can, I can begin to really notice how, you know, what self-consciousness is, fear of what others think, jealousy and envy, how I worry, you know, worry about the future. On a person, as a person. And then awakening to that personality is not judging it, but knowing it, it is what it is. And, and then you, you, be, you recognize, you have the insight, the suffering of becoming, of always becoming this changeable, ephemeral, unstable person to recognizing the peacefulness, the stillness, the stability of being the awareness. So you make your choice. There isn't really much of a choice when you see it. It's not taking sides like, a, you know, kind of annihilating the personality. And I still have personality, still operates, it's operating right now, but I know it. There's a knowing, knowing what it is. Not, no longer grasping it. No longer believing it and, and being blinded by my personality. Personality still arises according to conditions to the eight worldly dhammas, arises and ceases. But the difference lies in the discerning ability, isn't it? The awakened consciousness, knowing the personality, then one you know, can still, you know, it's nothing, not trying to get rid of it, but recognize it and no longer limit myself, bind myself to it. Know better now. Know that it's like the fire in the fire sermon the, that we chanted the other evening. You see, all these conditions are on fire. You know, this, this, uh, this was preached to a, a group of fire worshippers, Buddha teaching all the fire sermon, the Dita Bariyaya Sutta. And he's saying everything, all that is like fire. When you, when you grasp fire, what happens? You, you hurt yourself. Now fire is, can be used with mindfulness or heed, heedlessness. So I mean, you, fire is a, is a, you know, keeps you warm in the winter time, you, you know, you have light to read at night and all kinds of useful things. The fire is, is nothing wrong with fire. But heedlessness means that we burn ourselves. We, dis we hurt ourselves endlessly by grasping the fire. So when you see that all the, the world is on fire, the conditions are fire, then you develop this weariness. You no longer fought, see the world in terms of something, you know, that you've got to get or get rid of or control or change. You've seen it for what it is and then you, you, you let go. You would say, Nipindati, that sequence of all these, this uh, refrain of Nipindati means uh, a kind of seeing through the grasping, being weary, no longer, you know, seeing how, how boring and wearisome it is to just endlessly grasp fire and get hurt all the time. To just be caught, a kind of helpless victim of this ignorance, endlessly burning ourselves. For what purpose? You know, just, you know, it's just habit and ignorance, and we have this sense of 
nipita or nipindati, weariness of it. Which is, isn't like a negative state of, you know, of aversion. It's just, you know, this is, you know, this is not on anymore. This I'm not going to do. So that's why the world, you need to know the world. <laughs> know what the world is, what the self is. They so talk about the world in these terms. Or Sakya Diti, same thing. Cultural conditioning. You know, the assumptions we have from cultural conditioning. Just the, the way the mind conditioned and programmed through being born in, in Britain or France or Japan or Thailand or America. We acquire a cult cultural attitude, cultural assumption. And so with awareness, we begin to see through that, through the conditioning, <coughs> cultural conditioning, personal conditioning, and the conditioning itself of Thinking. Thinking is a condition function. To the pure intelligence, pure awareness that we recognize in bhavana. So this recognition, third noble truth, realizing non-attachment, letting go, cessation of conditioned phenomena is like this. So it's a nipindati, weariness, nipita. You let go of the world. It ceases. And there's discerning. Cessation is, has happened, you know. I realize the absence of this condition. Absence of grasping is like this. Non-grasping is like this. So this is uh, in, in developing the path, Eightfold Path. This you, you know, you, this is what we do with our lives. You say it here in the Amravati, the monastic form, what is it for? What is the purpose of being a monk or a nun? And then we can form opinions and views, like, it's, you know, some, some people hold to the view that the only way you can ever get really enlightened is by becoming a monk or a nun. And that's another viewpoint, isn't it? Others hold views that it's totally unnecessary you don't have to. You can be enlightened without monastic discipline. And these are views. But say, using the monastic form, what this monastic form, what I found helpful with it, is that it's, uh, you know, it's a convention a moral convention you know, restrains me from, in, in terms of action and speech, and uh, encourages simplicity, simplifies life. Like my life is very simple; it's not a complicated life. In the on the conventional level, and then uh, contentment all these reflections on the uh, four requisites and this, uh, uh, developing a sense of gratitude and contentment so that you're not endlessly, you know, if you, if you have no contentment, you're not grateful for the opportunity, then you, you always think of something better. The, you know, something looks better somewhere else. 
or you, you know, one complains because you can always see how to improve things, how to improve Amravati and make things better. And so we can spend our lives endlessly trying to improve the convention and not ever feel content or ever recognize or realize the Dhamma. It's like endlessly manipulating the condition realm so it becomes a utopian Buddhist monastery. That's what we want. A utopian perfect Buddhist monastery. Where it's just absolutely perfect, totally fair and just, pleasing every individual member totally. This is an ideal. This is a beautiful ideal. But the Buddha didn't establish the Sangha on ideals. It's not on how it should be, but it's expedient means. So in order to, we have the time, the opportunity, encouragement for awareness, which we, if we're endlessly dis following discontentment, then we, we, we aren't aware. We're, we believe our views. So in, in uh, being content with the four requisites doesn't mean, you know, to, to feel that you have to be content on some personal level. But this, this uh, reflection helps the one to recognize discontentment. Like in my uh, beginning years at Wapapo, you know, I could, by using this, this uh, Samana Sanya reflection on four requisites, I became aware of what discontentment is. I couldn't make myself content just as an act of will, even though I would like to have. Now the ideal of being contented is very nice. I quite like, you know, it inspires me. The idea of being content to me is, uh, you know, on a level of inspiration. It inspires. But it doesn't make me content. It would just make me feel guilty about being discontented. So, you know, you're living there and you, you know, a good bhikkhu is content with what he has and then, uh, and then I find myself complaining, grumbling, resenting, envying others and then I think, oh, I shouldn't be this way. I should be content with my robe and bowl and the food and uh, I shouldn't complain, I shouldn't envy anyone else and then I feel guilty and all this is sakya ditti, isn't it? I'm just using monastic life to reinforce this, the problem. Or awakening to discontentment is like this. Wanting something that somebody else has is like this. Complaining about things. I was, I'm, I was quite a whinging monk in the beginning, complainer. I started listening to this complaining, this kind of whinging thing in me. I don't see the point of this. <laughs> and kind of this, this whine inside me that would complain about things. Listening to it without condemning it but recognizing it, the suffering how how miserable I could make my life in the monastery by believing my complaining mind, being caught into it. As soon as I observed it, this nipita, nipindati came forth, a weariness of whining and complaining and blaming. A weariness, boredom with it. Think, do I want to spend the rest of my life complaining, whining about things, and then re be reborn again for another lifetime of whinging? <laughs> and when you listen to yourself complaining, it is, it is very unpleasant to be a whinger and complainer.
So then the weariness of letting go don't have to be like that. And it's not through feeling guilty about it, but recognizing, seeing clearly the dukkha, the suffering of, of grasping those conditions and becoming like that. You know, seeing it, uh, there's a not, there is the unborn, uncreated, unconditioned. So then that is the mindfulness, being aware of the condition rather than becoming the condition. So this is, this is the discerning ability, the satipanya, that the Buddha encouraged, and this is what the teaching is for, to awaken understanding. We're not here just to escape life and get out of the rat race on, on personal level because we can't face life in the real world like many people claim. The purpose of the holy life is for understand, awaken, for enlightenment, for seeing clearly. <coughs>